Testing. Okay, I hope uh, everybody will take their seats. Hope we'll you get a good break. And uh, rather than saying we're ready for the next presentation, I guess I should be saying we're ready for the next show. Where, what, who else would I be introducing to say we're ready for the show rather than the presentation? It's a combination. Uh, as most of you, most of you uh, know our next speaker, Blaine Hartman, he's been, as, as Bart was, he's been a regular participant in these meetings for a long time. He, he's another one that started Vapor Intrusion when he was a teenager, so he's got lots of experience. Uh, one thing you can say about Blaine is it's never dull, the presentation, and he stepped up his game, of course, lately with these... Uh, accompaniment his uh, crew here so I I would say without further ado let the show begin so fine <laughs> okay so nice to be back with live faces and I, I think you probably all feel that way Terrible talking to the TV uh, laptop screens all this time. So nice to see everybody again. Those of you who have been listening to me, I guess, over the years know that I always like to inject something into the presentations, otherwise I bore myself. And so I've had, uh, as you know, video things, and I've shown whales and lions, and, and I've also had music in there. And then in tw 2019, uh, when Paulo from Brazil was here, who's a very good bassist, and Mark, Graham, my business partner, is an excellent guitarist. I said, maybe we should take this a step further and, uh, and make music live, which is what we did. And now that we're four years later, and it turns out Paulo was back here again from Brazil, so we decided we would uh, do it again. Maybe that's a song we should add to this. But meanwhile, while we're doing all that, I'm supposed to talk to you about there's some science. And so the science we're going to do, based on what I heard yesterday, there's a lot yesterday, a lot yesterday. And a lot of it was technical, and a lot of it was more research, I would say, oriented, evaluation, and that type of thing. And so I said, well, uh, maybe I'd like to take what they did yesterday, and maybe let's bring it down to uh, the real earth kind of thing, the real world, and let's talk about uh, applying some of the technologies they talked about, the tools they talked about, to really where the rubber hits the road. So that's what this talk will be about, and then we'll see how things go from there. And by the way, uh, when we talked about doing this, we would love it if you join in to some of the some of the cuts you're going to hear, especially if you obviously know the song. All right, so enjoy. First, uh, I wanted to tell you where this is coming from. This being the opinions and the and the uh, ideas I'm going to share with you. Okay. We've been doing this monitor now, Mark and I, as a business partnership for close to 10 years, and I was doing it before that on my own. We now have over 200 monitor projects to date. So we have a pretty, pretty good database on this. Most of the projects have been at commercial sites, okay? Some residential, but most of them commercial. Most of our projects are when they are occupied, okay? And so that is huge because people People are a big factor in all this. Uh, mostly inhabited, like I said. We collect climate data at all the sites. That means wind speed, barometric pressure. You've heard a lot about that in the last few days. And when we can, we like to collect differential pressure. And I'm gonna go through and, and give you examples of all this. One thing I forgot to do, though, was to tell you, to introduce you to the, uh, to the uh, quintet, the Vapor Save Quintet. So, let's do that. Uh, Mark Cram, my business partner, lead guitarist. Brazil, our vapor safe rep in Brazil. Our vocalist, Clint Hartman. Well done. 
And then we, then, that's the baby. We were all made the stage plane as well, Phil, Phil Kennis. And then we have two guest vocalists. We tried to assume some of you enjoyed this, but our two guest vocalists, Susie Nowickis from H&P Mobile Jig. She was, that was the 2019 quartet. We got a quintet this year because Laura Trezolo jumped in. She's a guest from TRC Solutions. So there's the quintet this year. Okay. We've been around the block a few times. Now, a couple takeaways from the EP8 workshop that I saw. There were a lot of them. It was a very good performance yesterday from all you people that put that together. A lot of material. The first one was about this, this uh, RME, reasonable maximum exposure, right? Did I get that right here? Right? Okay. So that's the text from the EPA document, which I highlighted and read for you, based on decisions based on reasonable maximum exposure. So that means that I suppose then that you might, all of you, would be interested in RME. Right. Okay. This from EPA and here in our, our uh, people that want RME. I haven't had one phone call in all the years that I've been doing vapor intrusion from anyone asking me about RME. So we'll see if that changes. But that's where the rubber hits the road. All right. Now, if you're going to try to do this measurement or try to get to this, uh, should we say, level, it's very, very difficult to do this. In fact, I think probably close to impossible to do it inexpensively at least canisters for passive collectors. You've got to use some other tool or technique. Uh, monitoring is one that I think could get us there. All right. That brings us to the risk. Trying to use data to do risk evaluations. Well, if you only have a few data points, then you're going to be doing risk evaluations uh, with, well, not a lot of data points. So monitoring gives us some advantages on doing risk. And I call it improved VI risk capabilities because you can do monitoring over different periods of time, say 24 hours, but then you can break that data up into time segments, four hours, eight hours, depending upon what's going on at that facility. So imagine you're doing a school. You can monitor for 24 hours, but you can then look at the time when the kids are there, calculate the essentially indoor air concentration do the risk evaluation. You can do that then when the workers are there, it's going to be a different time interval than the, than the children, see? So we can do those types of things when monitoring. We can take the data set, collect it over time, and we can essentially parse it and then calculate risk for different time periods. Mark talked about that yesterday. Okay, the other thing that we can do is we can identify spurious data. So hits that happen, detections that happen during the monitoring period that clearly are not from below. I'm going to show you examples of this. You can't do this with canisters or passive. You get a number from them, but you don't have any idea what happened during that time period that that number was essentially collected, that sample was collected. We get to see that with monitoring data. I'll show you that. Okay. And we can also, if we're collecting differential pressure data, and, that, and by that I mean cross slab pressure, if we're collecting that data, then we can look at the monitoring data, the concentrations, when, only when the times are positive pressure. In other words, when vapor intrusion essentially is turned on. And we can look at the data when the, the pressure, cross that pressure is not positive. And so we can tease out the data there to see if during positive pressure times, if we really have any risk or not. If you don't, if you don't have any risk exceedances when the pressure is positive from slab to over, over the first floor, then you may not have any reason to go back. Again, it's a good database to take to the regulators. 
Okay, so some examples of this. That there's data that's indoor air data of TCE collected at an Aqua factory. They were making furniture. Turns out they were making uh, couches for living spaces. That's where my couch is from. And so there's the indoor air. And what I've done there is I've bracketed when the workday times were. You see that? And so during the workday, there are two workdays we did this. You can see that we had some pretty high detections over those two days. But you saw at night when they went home and the shift was, they weren't working. They closed out for the night. There was nothing there. So by having the monitoring data, so we could parse this out like this and we could determine what the risk was when the occupants were there and when they're not there. You couldn't, you can't do this with a canister. Or, oh, you know, I'll just put them out there when they're working. Uh, but you don't know this, these types of things when you go out and set up. This gives us that ability. Here's what I meant by spurious data. So if you look at, if you look at the data before and after the peak, it's basically zero. Those are flat, those are three different areas in one facility for monitoring. So three different rooms. And you can see everything pretty much is zero. And all of a sudden you get this big hit. All right? Well, we have alarms that go off. They send us messages with something like this happened. TCE gets above 10, boom, you get an email, you get a text or whatever you get these days, all right? And so then what we can do is ring up the facility. What's going on in there? And sure enough, that hit was when the janitors were uh, cleaning. It was from their cleaning product. So if you had a passive collector out there for this period of time, you might have seen a pretty high number in that passive collector because it's biased by the spurious hit. We can look at it and say, hey, what's going on? We can make a media phone call. We can eliminate it, essentially, from the data consideration. Here's one that we did. Alyssa, this is from uh, our, what is it, something uh, exotic? Edible arrangement. Oh, OK, yeah. Edible arrangement store. And we were monitoring there, and everything was real low chloroform. Bar F was talking about chloroform. We were actually looking at chloroform, and then all of a sudden, the next morning at 7 in the morning, boom, over 100. We go in there at the, an hour later and say, hey, what happened an hour before? Oh, that's when so-and-so comes in and starts washing up the dishes from the day before and gets ready for the next day of making the edibles. So we were able, essentially, because we had the monitoring data to sort that out. And we would not have been able to do that with the other, other tools. All right, the next thing that I took away from EPA yesterday, this is from them, is they want to use other types of methods now, in addition to the traditional ones. And obviously, I've been preaching about that for many years. The second bullet there says that's their text, not mine. One to four rounds, I would assume, is essentially what rarely ideal. It's not my statement for change, it's actually that came from the EPA text, okay? And the first bullet talking about false negatives, or as I showed you, false positives. And then they say, well, here's some other tools you can use, uh, well-established tools, is what they call them, that's their text. And I put down in red, uh, where one of the tools continuous monitoring. So I've been preaching to you about monitoring for 10 years or more, and uh, it's nice to see that it's, uh, it's being it's finally getting into the, into the play, into the toolbox. All right, this is a slide I've been showing for years, and it says here's the problem when we use traditional methods, meaning canvases and passive. This is what you get after that sample period, whether it be eight hours, 24, or seven days, or whatever. You get a number. And what do we do? You compare it to a screening level. And then you, you go back, in this case, and you're going to go back, and you go back, and I can make a lot more dots because a lot of jobs we get on, they go back and back and back many, many, many times, months and years. Okay? This is the fundamental problem there. You don't get enough information to be able to sort these things out. And when you go that first time, the first dot, if it's above a screening level, guess what? You're guaranteed to go back again. Guaranteed. If it's below the screening level, in most state agencies, you're still going to go back again because they want two rounds, okay? You're going back. Good for you, the consultant, billable time. Bad for you, the responsible parties. With monitoring data, we have the capability, the possibility in one visit of figuring out it's not coming from below, of determining, I'm gonna show you examples of that if we have time. All right, with what real-time data can do and traditional data cannot do. 
we can identify the factors controlling the patterns that we see, okay? That's because we have both concentration data and variable data, like pressure. We can, in one visit, many times we've been successful in determinants not from below, it's from inside, indoor source. If we do that, then you don't have to go back again. That's a key point. We can evaluate vapor intrusion, as I said, during positive cross slab pressure. So in other words, when VI supposedly is on, we can determine a site-specific attenuation factor. I'm gonna show you some slides on this. And we can test potential remedies in real time, in real time. So I'll show you examples of all of that. We get a pattern when we do continuous monitoring. And we do this continuing monitoring when we set it up, it runs all through the night. trying to determine what factors uh, influence indoor air concentrations, okay? I've shown this slide before. People, people, and what they do, and what they're using. That is the biggest factor influencing indoor air. So we love it when we're, when we're going to do a vapor intrusion investigation when the place is empty, because it's a lot simpler. But when there's people in there, then all kinds of things happen, and that's why when we monitor, we can look to see what happens when they're there, and when they're not there. And that's a key, key piece of information. And by the way, for those of you here in 2019, you might remember that when that people, when we came to that, that the song that we played then was uh, People of Strength. People of Strength. When you are strange. Right. All right, the next one, the HVAC system. You've heard a lot about that, I think, over the last day or so. Um, is it on, is it off? What's the makeup ratio, meaning fresh air to recycle air? And so we've been at a lot of sites where we've been turning it on, turning it off, monitoring data in real time. We get to see what happens to the indoor air when it's on and off. And, it's, uh, and, and those changes are very quick. And we've also had sites where we've changed the makeup ratio and see what happens. Sub-foundation pressure, I already talked about that, or cross-slab pressure. We call it differential pressure. Climatic variables, you've heard about this, barometric pressure, wind speed, temperature, and all of those, okay? In order, really, in, in most cases, not all, but most cases, that's the order of significance. People, then HVAC, then DP, and then some of the other factors. That's other site. We've seen those, all those factors be the key factor at sites, but generally, number one and two, and three, okay? All right, effects of differential pressure and parametric pressure. So this is slides that we've been showing for years, Mark showed it. So the key is the first floor to be under pressure. Differential pressure is, is indeed the key when it's positive, meaning positive below the slab. Essentially, it's pushing air up into a structure. You've got a structure with floor drains. You'll see those indoor air concentrations take off like a rocket when there's positive pressure under the slab. The other one, the bottom plot, is what you've seen from others, barometric pressure. And what you got to understand, it's real critical you understand this, 
is it's not the absolute value of variance and pressure that's important. So if you have guidance out there, or if your protocol is to measure the barometric pressure when you put out the canister and pick it up, forget it, it's garbage, okay? What's important is the change of barometric pressure, I call it the delta. So the top pressure show, or the top figure shows TCE concentration versus barometric pressure from that plot below. There's a perfect correlation in that part below when that gray line dips to where we get high concentrations. So it's the change of barometric pressure. When it drops, we see increases in indoor air values, but we don't see it based on the absolute value of barometric pressure. That's what that top plot is showing you. But the bottom plot is showing you indoor air concentrations versus DP, and you can see it's a perfect correlation. So with DP, differential pressure, it's an absolute number that you're measuring. For barometric pressure, you're looking at the delta pressure change, not the absolute number, keep that in mind. Okay, now let's look at a couple examples of indoor versus, versus uh, vapor intrusion source. So there's perk in two rooms in a place. There's uh, barometric pressure, VP. There's differential pressure, VP. Uh, differential pressure, sorry, DP. And I highlighted in yellow where I want you to look. And what you can see, the two rooms, you see perk rise very high in the beginning, in the two, two locations there, and two times, time on the X axis. And then you see differential pressure below, and you see the increases in perk perfectly correlated with increases in DP. And if your eyes are good, you can see the barometric pressure is dropping there. That's exactly what we see. In when we see that on a site, if we see that in one night of monitor, we can tell you right there, it's a VI problem. We know it right then, that quickly. Okay, here's one where we're measuring per TCE and barometric pressure. Look at the barometric pressure going up. Look at the perk going down. Well, that seems to indicate the perks from below. And look at TCE. It's doing its own dance. It's not following the perk at all. It's not following the BP at all. What did that tell us? The perk is coming from below and not at very high values, but the TC is from an indoor source. That's two days of monitoring. That costs, what, five or 6,000 bucks. We figured out the answer. They didn't have to go back. How much money did they save? So that's what we tried to do. There's one that uh, Clint's been on now up in San Rafael for uh, three times now. It's a brand new house. They haven't occupied it. Beautiful. We love going into unoccupied structures, okay? And so we couldn't figure out where the perk was coming from. They couldn't figure out the client, the consultant. They had a SSD. They had a membrane. They didn't have high values in the risers of the SSD pipe. And yet, look at the perk values. If your eyes are good, that's going up to a, I put it in red, 62, 96, 85 micrograms per cubic meter. And the other stunning thing is it's on the first floor and the second floor, two-story house. Those are high numbers. So what we did was we purged out the house with fans, got the values down to about zero, and then we went to monitor mode, closed up the rooms, monitored the rooms with the doors closed, and look what happened. That's a lot of mass, the perk. And it can't be coming from below. It's gotta be from inside. And guess what? We still haven't figured out where from inside. Yeah, interesting. Huh? So that's what we're still trying to figure out. We know it's coming from inside. And it's gotta be a huge source inside. We're thinking it's the entire flooring. So the builder is actually ripping up all the flooring now. And we're gonna do this again, hopefully, when the floor is removed. So these are the types of things we get involved with and can do when you have this type of data. We talked a lot about attenuation factors people have over the last few days. Uh, radon's a great thing to use. As uh, you heard Glenn Defani talk about, radon does have uh, some drawbacks. I won't go into those, but I, I'm a radon supporter. But we can also do this with continuous monitoring data of the VOC itself. So uh, it's a much more robust data set. We can differentiate the attenuation factor when it's occupied or not. It's probably gonna be different when people are in there and when they're not, or they're working and when they're not. We can look for the effects on the attenuation factor when the HV is on and off. You can do all this with monitoring data. You can't do any of this with traditional methods, okay? We can look at the attenuation factor during positive pressure versus negative pressure under the slab. Uh, it's superior than using radon. It may not be more expensive. I'll leave that for you to decide. 
I am a supporter of radon, but this is also a good way to do it. So I'm showing you actual data where we monitored indoor air and soil gas at the same time. Plotted here is actually attenuation factor, the inverse on the y-axis, inverse attenuation factor versus time. And what you see there is it changed over this. I think it's uh, seven days of time. Wasn't a big change. It's less than a factor of two. So that's a pretty robust data set. And you can take that to a, to a regular and say, look, we have a range of, you can see what the range is, and that's what we're gonna use when we do our evaluation. And you'll probably get acceptance on that because that's a good data set to show. More than one rate on that. Here's another one. The top graph is indoor air over time. The bottom graph is sub-slab concentrations over time. The indoor air changed by roughly a factor of two over this time period. The sub-slab didn't change at all. I got it, thank you, yeah. And you can see below, I put with the range down. So again, another robust data set to determine the site-specific data factor. And that's only two days of time, I think. That's it, not much money to do that. That can save someone a lot of money. All right, and then um, testing remedies in real time. We can go there, we can make HVAC mods, like I told you, we can turn fans on and off, turn on air filtration units, seal cracks, uh, turn on shop vacs, all kinds of things, and look at the changes in real time. Here's a slide from the local uh, Santa Ana Water Board where they use monitoring data. This is their slide, not mine, and you can see in yellow, uh, they found that not monitoring data really helped them determine the effectiveness of SPE. And here's another site where we actually had a shop vac. We hooked up a shop vac to a subfloor conduit to see the effect. And you can see between the lines, the first two lines, vertical lines, you can see the values drop. We went, oh, this seems to be working pretty good. We turned the vacuum off. They all went back up again. There's a three, three locations in the building. And then we turned it back on all the way to the right, and they all dropped. These are the types of things you do in real time. That's two days of time. Okay. Most office ask questions. What does continuing monitoring cost? And, and by the way, the, the uh, misconception out there is it's too expensive. It can be expensive, but in many cases it's very much not. So about 2,200 bucks a day, 150 analyses over 24 hours, uh, 10 or 15 canvases will cost you just as much. And plus we get the opportunity to maybe close that pathway, maybe in one visit or certainly a lot faster. We're gonna close it a lot faster than traditional methods. Do the agencies accept? Um, we haven't had any that we know have rejected us coming in, rejected our data. We don't know a plan. If any of you regulators out there <laughs> uh, disagree, uh, now's your time. And we've worked all around the country. And uh, we're down in Brazil, we're in Australia, so uh, Navy lists the fact sheet, and now EPA, of course, is, has listed us too. So, it's very well accepted. They love this stuff. Lots of data to work with. How do our results compare? I ask that all the time. Um, we've done over 200 projects. I've had two where my data did not match the off-site confirmation data. One of the times it was a lab contamination in the SUMAs. And the other time, I didn't calibrate properly. <laughs> all right, conclusions. Monitor, continuous monitoring gets lots of data, high resolution data, and it gives us a pattern. The pattern, the pattern, that's the key. It's a wonderful opportunity to And 
the thank you is for listening to me for 20 years or more, for those of you who have and putting up, I know, I know, I, I know you all know me and know that it's all facts, no opinions, <laughs> fair and balanced, but, but I want to thank you for, uh, for letting me be myself. to the stage for the next presentation. <laughs> that, would, that would be good. <laughs> okay, well, let me get the next presentation up. I'm sure if they do have questions, Blaine will be around to answer those questions you might have, but not right now. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to guess that this is it. Uh, nope. All right. Well, Henry, I'll try to figure out where yours is. This 